2003 is one of the most significant years in gaming history, and one of the titles that contributed to the year's catalog is Atlas's entry into the mainline Shin Megami Tensei series. SMT Nocturne had its issues commercially, but critically, it was a success. Despite having a big victory under their belt, they weren't done just yet. Atlas's ambitions were still growing. Wanting to expand outward into an even wider audience, Atlas and the development team began work while dealing with Nocturne, hoping to make an entry that would appeal to all sorts of people. The result was the Digital Devil Saga duology, a spin-off series that has garnered cult following by players. Yet even with this cult following, these two games have often been hit with criticism for various reasons. From gameplay, to story, to theming, to the behind-the-scenes practices Atlas pulled with both the games. And I'm here to figure out if those criticisms are truly justified. Digital Devil Saga was first pitched and conceived in 2002, during the midst of Nocturne's development, by none other than Kazuma Kaneko himself. Going under the development title, New Goddess, Digital Devil Saga was meant to once again broaden the appeal of SMT to even more fans than Nocturne did, while staying with the series' roots. To keep the roots of SMT intact, old staff members were brought onto the project. In particular, Katsura Hashino returned, the director of Nocturne, and future director of Persona 3, 4, and 5, along with Makoto Kitano, who was design director. Atlas also wanted to bring in cinematics for the first time in an SMT title, so they brought on a noteworthy anime director, Ichiro Itano, who was tasked with storyboarding and character movement choreography. Atlas's staff were still working on Nocturne while all this was happening the team was split into multiple divisions, each in charge of a certain aspect of the game's design. Atlas knew that the battle system in Nocturne would stay, adjusting aspects of the formula used in the mainline entry, and tweaking them to make Digital Devil Saga stand out, and even attempt to incorporate the game's themes and concepts, which were heavily taken from Buddhism and Hinduism, which I'll discuss in a moment. It's worth pointing out that Atlas's ambitions with the project were so large at the time that the team kept facing the issue that they couldn't fit the entire game onto one disc. According to the developers, supposedly, the amount of data in the game's files are twice the overall size of Nocturne's, which seems incredible since the aging PS2 could handle Persona 3 and 4 just fine, and as well as Final Fantasy X, Gran Turismo, and so on, games that are much larger than DDS ended up becoming. While all of this was happening, Kazuma Kaneko was tasked with designing the characters and demons as usual. Originally, Kaneko was instructed to make the main characters all wear tribal uniforms, and add on their Atma tattoo somewhere on their bodies to signify their demonic power. However, it's clear based on the final product, Kaneko inevitably shifted away from the tribal garb and gave each of the main cast normal-esque clothes. 
The gray uniforms each character of the world had was intentionally brought in to help distinguish the character's unique colors. Kaneko also added unique elements to each individual member of the main cast, like Gale's hood, Heat's cape, or Argilla's... um... actually, what is that? A dress? Surf, the main character of the game, is unique compared to other SMT protagonists in that he can't have his name changed unlike every other one. He was also obviously a silent protagonist and given a mostly stern expression with few emotional moments to allow characters to project themselves onto the character. Even if it doesn't work, more on that in the story section in both games. Along with the human designs, Kaneko created the demon designs for each member of the main cast, originally making each person have more of an animal-like appearance when transforming, trying to show that the demons wish and have the urge to devour others, emphasizing it in both the narrative and visuals. Eyes were removed from each demon transformation as they stood out too much, and each person was designed with an elemental theme in mind, like Heat for example having a fire element as his main element since... He's red, he's angry, he's brash, and his freaking name is Heat. Those demon transformations were originally going to be in the first Shin Megami Tensei entry, since Kaneko at the time wished for the game's hero to swap between his human and demon forms at will. It was cut from the first SMT game and obviously re-emerged as DDS's main concept and gameplay feature. As mentioned earlier, the writers took inspiration from Buddhism and Hinduism ideas. Concepts and terms such as karma, atma, and nirvana were crucial to the game's plot points. In fact, they were accurate to the original definitions of the words as well. The game's story was first written by a woman named Yu Godai, a Japanese novelist who was contacted by Atlas in 2000, two years prior to the start of DDS's development cycle. She was approached mainly because Atlas wanted to collaborate with her on writing a video game scenario, which was something Godai had never done before. She agreed, and the submitted proposal for Digital Devil Saga was accepted by Atlas and she moved to Tokyo to help work on the project. To help with writing, Godai received help from Tadashi Satomi, a scriptwriter for Persona 1 and the Persona 2 duology. Godai wrote the story for DDS as if she were writing a novel, dividing it up into chapters, and according to the research I did, Godai only got as far as the first boss fight in the game. Because due to conditions she was living in, and the fact that she didn't really like living in Tokyo, Godai actually left the project, leaving the remaining story in the hands of Tadashi Satomi. Certain story threads and characters were added after Godai left the project, such as Gale. Godai didn't create the character of Gale, Satomi did. The theme for the story was supposed to be awakening and change, according to Kaneko, when proposing the game's concept to Atlas and the team. This idea originated from the characters and how they slowly changed due to the circumstances of the story. Other than that though, the game's development is pretty limited. Not even the cutting room floor has much, since it only really has unfinished or early character models, nothing related to extra areas or even dropped cutscenes. If you wish to look at the page yourself, I'll link it, but there really isn't much there that is worth covering. At this point, there's just the English translation and the voice acting to discuss. Well. Okay, I lied, because there is another element to this whole tale. Quantum Devil Saga, Avatar Tuner Quantum Devil Saga was a series of five novels released by Yu Godai in 2011 in Japan. It is a retelling of the game's events, but with Godai's own words, meaning that certain things were changed due to how Godai originally envisioned the story playing out. According to the Quantum Devil Saga wiki page, as well as the Megatent Discord, Character names were changed, Gale's impact on the story was significantly reduced, Atma names and or avatars were changed as well, and the ending actually stopped Angel, whose Atma was now named Lucifer, not Harihara. I haven't read the translated novels myself, though I am in the process of doing so as I am writing this script. If anything major ends up popping up, I'll edit it into the section, but I doubt I'll be mentioning it again since I only want to discuss the games, not the novels especially since an entire half of the story is completely missing in Godai's version. Now, when it comes to the English release and translation, the two people at Atlas USA, Tom Hewlett and Bill Alexander, spoke with IGN back in February 2005, two months leading up to the game's release in the US. They attempted to highlight the game's features without giving too much away, with varying levels of honesty. They also casted famous anime voice actors, including VAs who would end up returning to voice other characters in later Atlas titles. Some of these names include Yuri Lowenthal as Surf, Wendy Lee as Sarah, 
Crispin Freeman as Heat, Amanda Wynn Lee as Argilla, and Steve Bloom as Gale. Yeah, that's Steve Bloom. And aside from that, Shimigami Tensei Digital Devil Saga released in July 2004 in Japan, April 2005 in North America, and July 2006 in Europe. As I stated in my Nocturne analysis, Nocturne's press turn system completely changed Atlas's games forever, enabling a level of strategy and engagement few other turn-based RPGs can provide. Atlas, having struck gold with their previous outing, only needed to tweak the formula in a few ways, ones that will make Digital Devil Saga stand out on its own. Digital Devil Saga's first major distinction from its predecessor is that you were only allowed three party members out on the field at all times. You would think that this isn't much of a big deal, but it really is, because one single party member lost means one less pressed turn, meaning less options for you in battle. The second major distinction is that your party members aren't ones that you recruit, but are rather half demons, ones who act more like party members in traditional JRPGs. The Embryon all have distinct roles in combat. Surf, being the blank slate with infinite potential that he is, is able to change his attributes to the player's liking, allowing you to spec into any build you want. Argilla is the mage of the group, and is by far the best healer, fitting her personality as well. Heat charges in with the best strength of the group, Gale is an all-rounder, being good at just about everything but not great, and Cielo having the best agility, fitting with how much of a goof that he is. Compared to other SMT games, this already makes it unique among Atlas titles. But compared to other standard RPGs like, say, Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy, it's nothing special. But aside from those two changes, Digital Devil Saga doesn't really have much to say. Because... it's Nocturne. Again. With a few bells and whistles added. And it's really sad that you can just boil down both DDS games like that, because some of the new features they add are great, with caveats. First, there's the mantra system. Once again building off the ability to build your character however you want, both DDS games have this mantra system, which allows you to customize each of your party members with whatever abilities you wish. Want to turn Surf into a debuffing support man? Go for it. Want to try and have Argilla focus on hunt skills exclusively? Go for it. Want to attempt to make Heat a magic user? Go for it. The flexibility allows you to once again make any battle as easy or as difficult as you wish, which is keeping the series tradition. Battles in general are pretty much the same as in Nocturne. It's only bogged down by balancing, unnecessary padding, and useless features. Going from last to first, the features added in both DDS games are unfortunately not built upon and were not completely successful in either entry. Let's get the obvious one out of the way first. Human form. Since your characters aren't full-on demons, and are rather half-demons, they're able to transform into their human and demon forms at will. The Atlas West employees during that IGN interview mentioned that both the human and demon forms would be vital to survival in the game, and that utilizing both forms would happen often during gameplay and lead to great success. <laughs> oh, don't make me laugh. Human form is completely worthless. Not only are you much weaker in this form, susceptible to nearly any type of magic and physical attack, but the main issue is your piss-poor damage output. I know about this going in, so unfortunately I don't have much footage of me in human form to show off. But just know, there's a reason why most people who enter a battle in human form immediately flee it. Because it's a waste of time to transform and waste so much time doing so. That brings me to the pace of combat too. Say what you want about turn-based RPGs, but oddly enough some of them can actually be surprisingly fast-paced. It's all on the speed of the animation, the size of health bars, both for you and your combatants the attacks you have, etc. Nocturne was surprisingly enough on the faster end, despite the higher level of strategy and difficulty. Both DDS games though... they're much slower. To the point that it's like the game was set on half speed sometimes, or that the game is slowly loading in each animation every time you queue it up. Grinding will always be a staple of RPGs, but DDS is one of the more egregious ones I've seen yet. That mantra system I mentioned earlier is gated behind multiple hours of grind sessions where you run in circles while the extreme encounter rate feeds you demons to kill so you can get that sweet, sweet last word. The reason why there are so many grind sessions is because of the fact that each character has a different mantra grid, 
meaning that you need to grind effectively five times as much as you usually do if you want everything unlocked. Getting the best skills in the game, which aren't even usable in the final fucking boss, requires some players, no joke, a hundred hours of grinding. This is indefensible for a game that is statistically light on content, only having a main story that can be beaten in 20 hours if you go through the main quest like I did. Because I once again had better things to do and was not going to waste time off screen doing grind sessions, I did the only logical thing. I cheated. Yes, I used an XP cheat to get through the game, as well as a money and mantra cheat. Leveling up my characters to the appropriate level needed for the story, not trying to overlevel them so hard that it makes the game trivial. I'll defend myself a little bit in the DDS2 gameplay section, but just know that by the time I got to DDS, I was tired. Now we need to discuss the issue of balancing. Nocturne wasn't flawless, but at the very least you had to mix up your strategies from boss fight to boss fight, from dungeon to dungeon. Magatama drastically changed how you played Nocturne, and would affect how the Demi-Fiend's role was in combat. DDS has effectively the same thing. You need to worry about weaknesses and strengths, buffs and debuffs, etc. One problem. It lacks a mechanic similar in nature to Magatama. Instead, how the game prefers you handle these drawbacks is in the form of the Void skills. Once again, because of how your characters are actually half-demons and how they only have one demon transformation, they have set weaknesses and strengths. Surf is always weak to fire, heat is always weak to ice, etc. The game encourages that you have at least one person with a void skill for a boss fight, allowing you to absorb your enemy's turns and counter back with little worry for your own safety. But this boasts a problem. It removes the flexibility you had previously. In Nocturne, getting past Matador had multiple solutions. I may have highlighted objectively the most popular option, but there are still others. You could have either fused or convinced Nozuchi to join you, which also absorbed wind. You could have used a Bicorn to buff up your agility to match Matador's level. You could have used a Hifumi Magatama and absorbed any wind attacks yourself. Or you could... I think you get the picture. In DDS, the solution to reducing enemy turns is to either void elemental attacks or dodge them, either through stat buffs or getting lucky. And there's still the brute force option. That's it. I understand if you wanted to be really cynical, you could boil down all my options from Nocturne I just mentioned into one of those two categories, but you still lack most options. Plus the issue on the player's end is that there's really only one proper way to play through the game. Nocturne's main build preference was Strength. If you had a Strength build on the demi game, it made the mid to late game much easier and much more bearable. By that point, most enemies and bosses have few elemental weaknesses, and the only ones that do are very specific, meaning that it was much easier to either fuse or convince a demon that had that specific elemental property to help you. In DDS, the tables are flipped. Now magic is the superior option, to the point that physical builds are so bad that heat was dropped the second I got a Gale, and I never put him back in my party unless it was required, which it wasn't. Dumping 90% of your stat points into magic makes the game trivial. Argilla being the first party member you get makes it doubly so. And with Gale and Cielo having decent enough magic stats as well, you were never at a loss when it came to power. There's a reason why most of my footage has Argilla and Surf in it, even though you can take both of them out at any point in the game. Them and Gale were all I needed to get through it. There's little strategy involved when the three best party members are given to you instead of earned. And now comes the difficulty discussion. Many people actually rank DDS as one of the hardest SMT games, and yet for me, probably due to my cheats from earlier, I didn't have the same experience. I did hit two walls in the form of Janana's boss and Bat's second boss fight, but both passed relatively quickly. In fact, I didn't even die to Janana, and only died to Bat once before realizing what I needed to do. DDS in general just isn't as good of a game combat-wise compared to its predecessor. I didn't even mention the other unique things DDS does, like the hunt skills, which give you extra XP if you kill an enemy with them, handguns, which in practice are a new-ish type of element that certain demons are weak to, or the combination attacks, which use up multiple press turns, but can give you unique attacks that aren't seen anywhere else. It's sad that the combat is so frustrating and is the main deterrent to me even wanting to go back to DDS 1 and 2. Dungeon's design fluctuates in overall quality, both in visual variety and gameplay, but in general, DDS's dungeons are an improvement over Nocturne's and most other SMT games, curing the habit of having a guide next to you while you play. 
DDS 1 and 2 are the only games in the series thus far that I have went through completely blind without needing to open up a guide on game facts. Thankfully, this was the only saving grace of DDS's gameplay because without it, DDS would be a near complete failure on the gameplay front. Thankfully though, DDS isn't praised for its gameplay. It's for its multi-layered story. Unlike Atlas's previous venture, Digital Devil Saga thrusts players right into the narrative with a pretty confusing opening that gives you no time to breathe. After witnessing the reenactment of the Matrix lobby shootout and seeing cannibalism for the first time, man, that's a roller coaster, the party wakes up to the sight of a naked woman and weird markings on their bodies. Compared to Nocturne, the introduction cutscene and opening few minutes of Digital Devil Saga are given at a breakneck pace. There's no talking with your friends in the hospital, learning of the end of the world, and your place in it. Because of this, the story can immediately form some minor disconnect with the player. Thankfully, Sladis Hana begins to truly intrigue, because we're introduced to two of the characters properly and disconnect among the party. After the first battle the Embryon faces, Argilla awakens to her emotions, gaining the color in her eyes, and is immediately disgusted by the prospect of eating her enemies. She doesn't like violence and hates the idea of killing. To which Heat responds with, Why do you hesitate? Circumstances are different now. If you refuse to eat, you will perish like them. It's interesting to see that the characters are on different pages with this new law of the land. Surf and Heat immediately accept it as part of their lives, regardless if they like it or not, while Argilla is still grasping at straws for it. Proceeding through, Heat gains his emotions too, and after this, we're given a call to the center of the world to receive instructions. Now, at this point, the game's been setting things up. It had multiple hooks thus far in my opinion, but they weren't the ones that got me. The moment that I was truly invested in the game wasn't the demon transformations or the dark cannibalism or even the awakening of emotions. The moment I was sold on DDS was weirdly enough from this exchange. You! Remember this. If you plunge the truth into Sarah, bring her into Nirvana, devouring everyone in your path! After this moment, I felt like there was something intriguing here. Unfortunately, the game becomes very standard in regards to its plot structure. Basically, the entire game's premise is conquering the other tribes until you're king of the hill. And after you conquer all the tribes, you can finally enter into the giant karma temple, climb to the top, and reach Nirvana, which is the vague ultimate goal of DDS-1. Unfortunately, this is as far as the game goes in terms of plot. Many people have criticized DDS-1 for having the depth of a puddle in terms of its narrative, and it's not hard to see why. Conquering these tribes is all that there is in the first game and there aren't any detours that change your goal. Along with that first criticism, the other is a much bigger issue. The story raises more questions than answers, and many of them aren't even answered at all in this first entry. The reason is something kind of frustrating. All of the game's questions were to be answered in the sequel that would come regardless of the reception of DDS1. This decision makes the first game feel lacking in terms of meat on its bones. Because of this split, many players probably felt frustrated with the first game because it didn't feel complete. So for the gap between DDS 1 and 2, there really wasn't a satisfying conclusion to anything that the game set up. And the most disappointing thing I feel is Sarah, who in this game almost veers into MacGuffin territory. Why's that? Well, she don't go talking good like me and you, so her vocabulistics is limited to I and am and sorry. Exclusively in that order. She's not an engaging character in the first DES, and seeing as how she's arguably the most important character in the plot of both games, that's pretty disappointing. There's aspects of the plot to be praised, and I'll get to that in a second, but just know that DDS1's story is frustratingly simple when you think about it, especially compared to the complexity of Part 2. However, much like other games I've covered on this channel, having a simple plot doesn't always hurt a game. Tales of Zillia is my favorite Tales game at the moment, and that game's plot is very simple, even with its twists and turns. But remember why I love Tales of Zillia. It's characters. DDS 
is no different. The Embryon are all great characters, even if some of them, much like the story, have the depth of a puddle in terms of complexity. Surf is the silent leader who doesn't give two fucks. He's willing to put his life on the line, blah 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 blah, you've heard the silent protagonist synopsis before. Heat is the hot-headed, quick to anger big man who's willing to do anything it takes to make sure that Sarah is safe. To an insane degree, actually, it's almost weird how far he's willing to go. Cielo is the fun-loving, goofy, happy-go-lucky guy who's just there to make anyone smile with his attitude. Also, he's Jamaican. I wanna come along too! I gotta redeem myself for all this! I saved the two best characters for last. Gale is arguably the best character of the entire DES duology, since he has both an intriguing arc in this game as well as a very significant backstory that is fully answered in part 2. The logical thinker of the group and being the only member of the Embryon whose past is a bigger mystery compared to the others, Gale ends up awakening to his emotions much later than the rest of the party, and it isn't until Lupa reveals the concepts of honor to Gale that he is finally able to express himself properly. And, yet again, he gets much better in part 2, since you have so much time with him fully awakened. And then there's Argilla. The emotional core of the story in my opinion, Argilla is the peaceful, non-violent member of the party who hates conflict and wishes to go back to a relatively normal life, away from these demon powers and endless cannibalism. I say she's the best because while Gale has much more complexity to his character, Argilla has far more screen time in both games, allowing her character to express herself more often. She's also the first to awaken to her emotions and has by far the best acting out of all of the cast. It only makes sense that the future Cherry Blossom herself would voice one of the better members of the Embryon. The cast is one of the reasons why I think DDS 1's story doesn't fully fail. The other is the bond that the Embryon have. You do get a sense that all of them are almost like a family, even when they're just arguing with each other, which makes sense considering what is revealed in Part 2. Jumping back to the story, the game doesn't get fully interesting until after you deal with the final tribe of the game and their leader, Varen, or as he prefers, Colonel Beck. Before his battle, Beck mentions to the party many various things that weren't discussed until then. How Argilla was devoured by Surf, how Varen doesn't recognize Gale, how Heats died for Sarah before. Beck's done with the junkyard, and he wants out. More so than the others because of how violent and angry he is regarding his situation. After his defeat, Beck reveals in a vagueish way that Sarah's the reason why they were all in the junkyard to begin with. All of the party? They died in a previous life, in the nirvana they're hoping to reach, and they were placed into this world. Their purpose? Unknown for now. Then, after doing their duty and becoming the leaders of the junkyard, the party starts discussing various things they never thought of before. How does Cielo know what cats are, even though he's never even seen an animal, much less a tame cat before? That cat's very important, just keep that in mind. Why is it that no one has ever seen a child in the junkyard? Or parents for that matter? How did they die and how were they put into the junkyard in the first place? Why did all this happen? What is the junkyard? Etc. All of these questions are things that the character and the player ask because both were purposely left in the dark. The party concedes that their new ultimate goal is to scale the Karma Temple, find Sarah, who mysteriously disappeared, and reach Nirvana, finding the answers that they seek. Scaling the tower like they said, the game concludes at the top, where the party witnesses the world that they've been living in seemingly deleted before their very eyes. They were in a virtual simulation this whole time. Sarah and the mysterious AI who appeared at the beginning, Angel, were in a standoff. Angels come to pick up Sarah and delete the junkyard. Now that the party has gained a bond with Sarah, they're not exactly about to let Sarah be taken away by some weird woman who just appeared out of nowhere. After their battle, Surf collapses the junkyard on accident, causing all of the characters to get stranded in a blind light, where they all promise they'll meet up in Nirvana together. And the game ends here. If that ending synopsis felt quick and rushed, that's because it is. Nothing is answered about Sarah's origins, despite being one of the questions the game asks within the first hour of gameplay. Nothing is answered about the Embryon's origins, or Angel's origins and purpose, 
the only thing that is given is that Sarah is called a Cyber Shaman. But again, it's a question, not a fucking answer. The more I write this script, the more DDS1 makes me mad, because the game's plot is so frustratingly vague that it's difficult to even come up with things to say about it. The most significant parts about DDS1 are anything that the characters say or do. Argilla befriending Janana, Janana's death scene, Surf and Heat's duel with Sarah's life on the line, Cielo's antics, Gale's awakening, etc. It's nothing related to the plot itself. It's the characters. A statement so similar, I swear I've written it before. But even with all of these issues, the tales of the Embryon weren't done yet. Because regardless of DDS's reception, Atlas had more in store for these half-demons. And boy, what a ride they would end up going on. Both the developer and the characters. So going into this analysis, I was under the assumption that Digital Devil Saga 2 was created alongside Digital Devil Saga 1. Seeing as how both games were very similar in terms of gameplay and dungeon design, and even plot structure, they didn't need to change much, and the story could be developed at a more natural rate with time instead of rushing it out the door when it wasn't ready. Nope! Do you want to know how long it took Atlas to make Digital Devil Saga 2? Do you want to know how long it took Atlas to make a 20 hour long RPG complete with twists and turns, plot revelations, and a proper mindfuck ending? You'll want to sit down for this. Six months. It took Atlas six months to make Digital Devil Saga 2. Starting development immediately after the release of the first game, there is so little history on the development of this game that there's only one paragraph on Wikipedia. And there are so few articles on DDS2 that I literally can only reiterate what the page on Wikipedia says. That Atlas wished to answer all the questions that the first game left, while expanding on the systems that the first game introduced. Atlas wished to also make the game smoother, and allow for faster motion for battles and cutscenes. Tadashi Satomi, the co-writer for Digital Devil Saga 1 and lead writer for Digital Devil Saga 2, described the real world, or Nirvana as you will, as being inspired by, quote, the frequent reporting of natural disasters and outbreaks of diseases around the world. Along with this, while Digital Devil Saga 1 primarily used the motif of rain, Digital Devil Saga 2 used the motif of sun. Digital Devil Saga 2's gameplay was expanded upon, refining it and opening up character customization even further due to complaints about the first game. And that's really all that's known about Digital Devil Saga 2's development. Aside from being assisted by a support studio, Kusanagi Corporation, giving Atlas art assets, DDS2 has nothing else to discuss in regards to its development. Frankly, it's more interesting to speculate what happened behind the scenes in regards to DDS2's production. Was the story thought up on the fly, or was it completed prior to DDS1's release and the team really just split everything up? Were there budgetary limitations? Was anyone cut from the team when DDS2 began production? Regardless, it's an accomplishment that DDS2 came out at all, considering that the dev cycle was nearly 6 months. There were minimal changes to gameplay, and the biggest addition was to the story, which got its proper conclusion. Sorry that this section is so short, but one last time, DDS2 doesn't have much to say in regards to its development history, and it was released almost exactly six months later, in January 2005 for Japan, October 2005 for North America, and February 2007 in Europe. Digital Devil Saga 2's gameplay, much like the first, is just Nocturne again. It's the same game again, with minor tweaks. Starting with the customization, Atlas retained the mantra system from DDS1, but now there's an extra addition in the form of rings. These rings give the party stat increases and bonuses. The rings in question can also give you bonuses like reflecting magic or giving auto skills when a battle starts. Each ring also has gems you can slot in that give you even more stats to improve your characters even further. However, you cannot replace a gem without destroying it, meaning you need to commit to a gem and ring when you put one on. Unfortunately, during my playthrough, I didn't use the rings that much due to... reasons I had mentioned in the previous gameplay section. 
Gaining rings is required from either buying them from vendors, finding them in chests, or defeating optional bosses, with the best rings and more unique ones being acquired from those bosses. This creates a feedback loop of going out and doing the optional content so you can get these options for your characters. I like the system, but I do feel like it's ever so slightly unnecessary because of the game's difficulty, which I'll get to later. If the game had the same approximate difficulty that DDS1 did, I feel like DDS2's rings would be a great addition that I'd welcome with open arms, even with the extreme benefits some of the rings give you in the late game. The combination attacks from the previous game make a return, but were balanced to make them less situational. But even then, I didn't use these combo attacks in either entry because they weren't entirely needed. The mantra tree from the first game is now replaced with a grid layout starting out extremely small and gradually expanding to the point that it's almost overwhelming. Each grid has a mantra for the character to unlock, while it's slowly expanding the grid out further and further. There are also these open nodes that contain what's known as esoteric mantra. These esoteric mantras can either contain very powerful skills, or have party-wide stat buffs. However, its appearance is very intimidating and awkward compared to the straight lines of DS1. I didn't max out as many mantras as I probably should have during my playthrough compared to DDS1, where I maxed out a good half or more of the tree per character. At the very least, the grid doesn't require you to restart from the beginning of one tree to unlock a good skill like the first game did. And DDS2 did give the player many options to allow one to gain money and Atma points easily. The Rich Ring allows for one to gain a lot of Maka very quickly and with the cells you find around the world in chests, you'll be swimming in money by the end of the game. And the hunt skills from the first game return, but are much easier to acquire, and can be stacked to gain even more points to max monsters quickly, especially by the end game. But other than those quality of life improvements to DDS's core gameplay, it's largely the same as the first. There's also one new system added in that fixes one of the more annoying issues with the first game. Remember that criticism I said where you can turn into human form and it's best to just flee? Well, DDS2 adds a new mechanic that mediates this issue. Sometimes when getting into battle, you'll end up having this half-demon, half-human form. This effectively acts as a berserk mode that gives you extra power while locking away magic and lowering your defense. Plus, you gain extra XP when finishing up one of your battles. Adding this new feature was such a nice addition. Not only are these designs honestly pretty badass, but they also give me a reason to use the human form, even if it's briefly. I never backed away from these fights, since I wanted to win them and gain the extra experience. They happen frequently enough that it's nice when they show up, but it's not shoved down your throat as often as you might think. The only thing to tackle now is difficulty and dungeon design. Difficulty was largely scaled down for DDS2 to the point that I didn't die at all during my playthrough, although this is because I once again cheated my way through. This is my defense, though it's not a great one. By the time I got around to Digital Devil Saga 2, I had played Nocturne twice, SMT4 once, DDS1 once, Persona 3 once, Persona 4 Golden on PC once, and Persona 5 three times. That's a total of nine playthroughs, almost back to back to back. I was tired, and by this point, I was done with dealing with Atlas's SMT bullshit. So I learned how to edit PNH files and decided instead to just level myself up to level 99 and steamroll through DDS2. Again, not a good excuse, but an excuse nonetheless. I'm not exactly proud of it, because I can't properly discuss the game's difficulty without that hanging over my head, but I'm doing my best with it. It's probably why I beat DDS2 in 12 hours, which is definitely not how long the game is. The final boss was probably the most time-consuming part of the playthrough, as it took up to a whole hour of playtime, even with the level 99 party. Then there's the dungeon design. While DDS1's dungeon design was drab in terms of its color palette, it did have some unique gimmicks when it came to the environment. The brute space had three distinct sections, Svada's Hana had doors, walled-off areas, and a few things to move around to progress. The sewers had tubes that launched the party around to progress as well. DDS2 continues this tradition with unique environmental interaction to a degree. But whereas DDS1 had both inside and outside interiors, DDS2 consists of purely indoor combat. And even more intriguing dungeons in DDS2 don't escape this. The Sun being the prime example. The Sun is the final dungeon. However, it's very drab in terms of visuals and is by far the longest dungeon in the game. 
In fact, I'd argue it's the longest dungeon in both games, even longer than the Karma Temple, the first one. It's disappointing considering that this is the real world and it's less interesting than the virtual drab junkyard that is... a junkyard. And it doesn't help that there are three things that are given to you that make the dungeon objectively worse. Depending on the choices you made throughout both games, as well as importing your save from DDS1 if you have one, you have the potential to gain powerful skills for three party members. Seraph, Argilla, and Gale. Argilla absorbs Janana's spirit and gains the Seraph War skill. Gale absorbs Lupa's spirit and gains the Paralegahethan skill, whatever the hell that is. And Seraph, if you answer the question correctly in the Karma Temple in the first game, you'll gain the Reincarnate skill. Effectively, all of these skills act as powerful attacks that very few skills can even hope to reach. Unfortunately, this does mean that the game effectively gives you the best party to use for the final dungeon, and only confirms my belief on something regarding the DDS games. The game gives you the best party way too early on. Surf in DDS1 could be built however you want, meaning he could be unstoppable way too early on and turn the game into easy mode. Argilla, having the highest magic stat of both games, means she is always useful in any situation. And the game, frankly, handicaps you when she's taken away in DDS 1 and 2 for certain sections. Gale having the best overall stats means that he's a good choice to have as a backup for any situation, be it physical, magic, or support. So, with a mostly similar gameplay loop, and minimal changes to the first game's squad design, both in combat and dungeon design, that leaves one thing for DDS 2 to get right. The story. Picking up immediately after the ending of the first game, DDS2's story starts off in a similar vein to Part 1. You're thrust into a conflict with little idea of what's going on, you're given a recap of the first game in the form of a new character with what look to be little children who look very similar to our heroes and heroines, remarking how people have made mistakes in the past, and how others must make up for their mistakes in the present. Flashing back in time, we see Surf, Argilla, and Gale together with a bunch of children as they try to get a grasp of the situation. A child leading the members of the Embryon is named Fred, who agrees to help the group find a man named Roland, who's the leader of the Resistance against an organization known as the Karma Society. I hesitated to talk about this first big bomb that the game drops on you, but I'm going to add it here anyway. DDS's world was originally called the Asura Project Phase 1. The junkyard was created to be a virtual reality, used to gather combat data. Said combat data was going to be uploaded into soldiers as AIs. So effectively, somehow, Surf, Argilla, Gale, Cielo, and Heat are all artificial intelligences that gain humanity and sentience through the power of gaining Atma. From here, I'm going to do my best to avoid speaking about most of the big moments of the story because it's going to be reserved for the next section. Just know that a lot of the story of the first game is given proper context through the events of DDS2, and it starts off within the first hour of gameplay. The game gets right down to business when it comes to its plot, much like the first game. Your objective is to find Sarah, who has mysteriously disappeared, find the other members of the Embryon, and find your own answers to... everything. And really, again, I don't have much to say about DDS2's story without delving into spoilers, because most of the game is just a straight line finish to the end. I'd argue one of the best parts about DDS2 is showing the genuine bond between the Embryon yet again. The first game had plenty of moments and I'm about to show them, but the second game truly puts into perspective how much these guys trust each other and how much they rely on one another. They're all comrades and view each other in a special way. Easy does it. Get out of here. Where are you going? <laughs> Surf, what was it he'd said he'd do back there? Yep. We'll tear you apart, you fat freak! Well, it looks like Bat got away. We will meet him again. He is strong. 
he would make a better ally than Cielo. Oh, come on! I totally saved Sarah back there! Are you joking? That makes me sick. Yeah, what she said! What is... joking? As far as I know, it means you aren't serious. I do not comprehend. Okay, this seriously won't work. Why is that? Obviously, Sarah isn't this tall, her hair is way different, and her arms ain't that thick. Ooh! Well, excuse me. Do you realize we could share the same fate as them? We all hate, we all fight, we all devour just to survive. But eventually we'll die. I couldn't defend myself. We aren't any different from him. What's the point then? Why live like this? Why are we even alive? Sir, tell me. Exactly. Knowing the truth wouldn't change anything. Who cares about this stupid world? So what if we died? Forget all that crap. Look at what all of us have become. We're, We're comrades. comrades. Then there's nothing to debate. Well, uh, I mean that, uh, you can't be a, a comrade alone. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Comments? Scale of one to ten, I give it a three. But all in all, I'd have to say that it's still pretty good for a hot-headed jerk, ja? Maybe if you spoke up a bit more. Whoa! You read my will to open the gate as a signal. You're quite the clever one, aren't you, Roland? You're hard to please. You got a point. That was pretty impressive. Oh, this is cute! Looks like you're pretty insecure beneath all that seriousness. <laughs> you can't be reasoning with God, bro. Maybe I could show him some jamming Latin rhythm, yeah? Oh, yeah, baby. Dig it. I'm sure you would only anger him. Really? Then why don't we see which one of us can convince God first? Agreed. This is also where I awkwardly segment into discussing the music for both games. As you likely have noticed, I didn't point out Shoji Meguro's work during DDS1, and that's because... And please don't kill me. The DDS duology has one of, if not the weakest, song selection of Shoji Meguro's entire career. No offense to the man. I know the quality of his work, he makes great music, but the DDS games just didn't do it for me. Nocturne's tracks were all unique, fit each area, and generally stood out, and the later Persona games were all excellent soundtracks, all three of them being added to my Spotify. But DDS's only few tracks that resonated were the opening intros, Mladhara, Vati.
I don't know what it is about the game's OST that just doesn't seem to truly work, but it just doesn't to me. And until something else comes along, I feel like it's the weakest soundtrack Shoji has created for the franchise. Segwaying back into the story, one of the bigger moments of DDS2 takes place early on, when scaling the Karma Society's building and finding Sarah for the first time. After all the struggling, Heat comes out of nowhere and is swayed to the Karma Society's side after being persuaded that it will protect Sarah, but also due to learning his origins. And from here, we're introduced and reintroduced to our main antagonist, Madame Cuvier and Jenna Angel, respectively. Both antagonists here are given proper depth as the game goes on, especially Angel, but to stick with Madame Cuvier for a moment, she does give an explanation to her plan regarding everything happening in the story. She wishes to basically play the part of judge, jury, and executioner, choosing who would be worthy to live in the walls of the city the game takes place in. While everyone is stuck living as a demon, consuming the other. Live under Madame Cuvier's rules and law, and you'll be safe. If not, you get eternal damnation. Along with this, upon being confronted, Angel helps the party to further her own goals. Her ideology explained while being confronted in her office, wishing for the idea of natural selection, the strong eat the weak, and all that. Wishing for complete and utter chaos. From that point, it's to the laboratory dome where Sarah is being held, the supposed person who put them in this hell. With everything that's been revealed thus far, you might be wondering why they're even still going after her, especially considering the trap that's about to occur. Upon reaching the bottom of the laboratory, Surf and the party meet up with any naked Sarah again, embracing her lovingly, only for QVA and Heat to step in and ruin the party. Heat, by QVA's orders, runs forward to push Sarah into making an ultimatum decision. Stand down and help her, or let Heat kill the party. To which Heat runs forward, and Surf gets stabbed. This event causes a shift in the world. A huge earthquake begins rumbling through the city, and God, because of course he was involved in this, ends up slowly devouring the planet. The reasons for this are due to Sarah and her reaction to Seraph's death. After this, shit hits the fan yet again, more stuff happens, the party gets separated due to a giant demon, Sarah gets her half-demon powers and learns that Seraph is still alive somehow, and they travel back to the laboratory to get him back. Okay, finally, I blaze through the story. I can finally get to the real meat of this probably hour and a half or so analysis. Now that we're at the halfway point, we need to talk about the twist. I will now be summarizing the entire plot of both DDS1 and DDS2. I will also be giving a second spoiler warning. If you have not played either Digital Devil Saga 1 or Digital Devil Saga 2, I recommend, no, I beg of you, please go and do that. I don't care how you do so. Track down PS2 copies, play the game on PS3, emulate it, I don't care, just please play the Digital Devil Saga duology. This twist does not have the same impact if I were to merely tell you how all of this is connected. You need to have played both games to fully appreciate this twist and everything that DDS does. I am not doing the writing team at Atlas justice by merely explaining everything I can to you. I will say this one more time. If you haven't played through the games, please do so. I can't stop you from watching this section, but just know, it's not going to be as significant. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. 30 years prior to the events of Digital Devil Saga, the world was on the brink of death. Crises erupted worldwide with mutated pathogens, abnormal weather patterns, collapsing ecosystems, and a new form of virus called the QBA syndrome. A virus that infects your body and turns you into stone, leaving the victim neither alive or dead arguably a fate worse than death itself. A group of scientists were formed to help combat these deadly diseases and problems. One such group is heading up a cure for the QVA syndrome. The person in question leading the group is a woman by the name of Jenna Angel. 
Now jumping forward 10 years before the events of Digital Devil Saga 1, Jenna Angel was the person who hypothesized that the sun was to blame for all the disasters that plagued the Earth, with the main culprit being a concept known as Data. Data effectively means soul in the DS game, so try to remember it as that. Supposedly, according to Angel, the sun, and by extension an aspect of God known only as Him for now, has been watching over Earth since its inception, and influenced the growth and change of the Earth itself. During this 10 year gap, Jenna ends up becoming close with a man known only as David. David being a member of Jenna's science team researching everything. She slowly grew feelings for him, but sadly, David contracted the Cuvier syndrome and was slowly dying. One fateful night, a group of terrorists attacked David's hospital ward and tragically, David lost his life that night. But before he died, lying in Jenna's arms, humming the same song that Sarah sings, he begged Jenna not to hate these people. But, of course, this didn't happen, and Jenna became the spiteful person we see in the game because of this event. All the murder, all the violence, all the betrayal, it was because of losing David. Jumping forward yet again, we're now at a five-year gap. By this point, the Karma Society has been formed, and Madame Cuvier was at the helm, authorizing her people to conduct experiments. The experiments in question involved either kidnapping or requesting for children to be donated to this project. These particular children were known as Cyber Shamans. The title of Cyber Shamans were given due to their innate ability to be able to speak and transfer data to and from God. However, these people were few and far between, and as we know, there's only 19 of them in the DDS universe, and there aren't any known Cyber Shamans in the world of DDS, at least ones that are still alive. Well. Maybe except for two. One of those cyber shamans was a girl by the name of Sarah Vita, or Sarah for short. The daughter of Jenna Angel, who was fond of Jenna's own sperm and egg, making Angel both the mother and father. Sarah was born with the innate ability to be able to communicate with God, and from a young age was experimented on by the Karma Society to gain knowledge on God, how to stop him, cure the QVA syndrome, and potentially harness his power. To help deal with all this testing, the Karma Society has multiple scientists involved with the project rather than Jenna's small team years prior. And the big player here, yet another lead scientist, was a man by the name of Surf Sheffield. Under his wing, helping him, is his assistant Argilla and Heat. Now, you might think that this is where all the characters, minus Sarah, begin to bond which would explain their relationship at the start of DDS-1. But in fact, that's incorrect. And we see just how different everything is with this opening flashback. How long are you going to keep this up? For crying out loud, Surf! She can't even live without that fluid! That's why you'll never surpass me. Since when did people start expecting science to be humane? To study the body, you cut it open. To study the mind, you isolate it by crushing the heart. Historically, that's how science has advanced. Surf isn't a good person. He's very cold, calculating, only focused on his own selfish goals. And Heat is clearly very open about disagreeing with that behavior. But it doesn't matter. Sarah is very fond of Surf and how kind and friendly he is, or at least how he pretends to be around her. Meanwhile, Heat actively makes her afraid, despite his want for Sarah to be happy and safe. The experiments continue for quite some time, long enough to the point that Sarah has begun to rapidly age. It's unclear whether or not her body just ages or if it's also her mind, but I believe that she's around the age of 6 or 7 before rapidly aging. Along with this, she has extreme mental and physical stress due to the nature of these experiments and the stress speaking God puts on her. As a result, as a way to relieve said stress, Sarah, somehow, I don't know how, created a virtual reality. One that acted as a personal paradise, where all of her friends could live together and have fun times. The people in question in this place were Surf, Sarah, obviously, Heat, Argilla, and another cyber shaman named Cielo. We aren't given any information about Cielo in either game. All that we do know is that he supposedly is a cyber shaman, and presumably got close to Sarah during all of the experiments. 
This virtual reality Sarah created also just so happens to have AI programs in them. Specifically, all of her friends are AIs in that world. And they have free will. Madame Cuvier and Angel take an interest in it while Surf, in typical fashion, finds the idea of that place annoying and frustrating. One day, during a visit from one Colonel Beck, Heat objects to the idea of continuing the project further, stating that Sarah's stress is off the charts and that she's rapidly aging. Beck ponders it for a moment and asks Surf if this is a correct statement. Surf, not wanting Heat to ruin his plans, says that nothing is actually wrong. The breaking point came on one of the testing days. Sarah's being hooked up to this giant machine, known as the EGG. On the verge of dying, words are exchanged, and... You know what? I'm just gonna let this play out. Can you hear me, Sarah? Hang in there, we're almost done. That's enough! Don't be a hypocrite. You wanted to learn about God, didn't you? That's why you joined. If Sarah dies, we move on to the next child. If that child dies, we use another. That's how it works. Honestly, we shouldn't be wasting time on trivial arguments. I think we're both better than that. You're really something, you know that? You can't just manipulate people to do whatever the hell you want! <laughs> oh, can't I now? Simple, huh? The human heart is a machine. We can predict the outcome of any action. Considering my goal is God's power, people are just tools. Because of this one event, everyone inside the immediate vicinity was corrupted, Surf being the first. God felt Sarah's sadness and betrayal, and Data flooded the building. Surf Sheffield became a demon, devouring everyone around him. Argilla first, just like Beck said. Eventually, Surf was killed as well. Sarah herself stayed in that chamber locked away for five years. She sealed her heart shut as the Ghost of Heat explained to Surf. She dreamt for Surf about a long time as well. The Ghost of Heat mentions that Surf's original traits reflect her perception of them. That idea is important, changing perspectives. The virtual reality that Sarah had in her life was now being used by the Karma Society. They reshaped it to form the world known as the Junkyard, or Asura Project Phase 1. These AIs, since they are code, could be reprogrammed in a way. And they were. But because Sarah was dreaming, as they say, and since she was changing her perspective on her friends, she was directly responsible for how our favorite Embryon members acted. Because the Surf she knew was a lie, Surf in the Junkyard was a man of few words. It's why he doesn't speak much. He doesn't have a personality because Sarah doesn't know what to think of Surf. It's why the dialogue options in the game exist in a sense. It allows not you, the player, but Surf to express himself, albeit to a limited degree. The good options that you can select revert Surf back to what Sarah thought of him beforehand, while the more negative or quiet options fit who Surf used to be. It is even said by Heat's former soul that Surf has grown into his own person, reflected in his fight back with his two selves in the EGG. Because Sarah saw that Argilla was not fond or outright terrified of violence and killing, that obviously reflected in her personality in the junkyard. She's the emotional core, the one who always prefers a diplomatic solution to problems and would rather not resort to violence. 
which is tragic when you think back to that one scene after wrapping up the ship dungeon in DDS-1. Heat, obviously, was very rash and angry towards Surf even in his final moments. That part didn't change and make sense, but the new, almost unhealthy obsession Heat has with Sarah is fully explained due to the flashbacks and twist. Once you realize that Sarah morphed her perspective on those three and by extension Cielo, even creating their personalities, everything about these characters makes sense. I haven't mentioned Gale yet because he comes into play later, but just keep him in mind. We now get to the events of DDS-1, where everyone is awakened to their emotions in Atma avatars. I normally skip over this section, but with the twist, quite a few new areas are given proper context. The palace dungeon known as Coordinate 136 was the same palace that Sarah created in that mindscape. The story of the two princes fighting over a princess is a clear correlation between Sarah, Surf, and Heat. In DDS-1, it's clear that the good prince is Surf and that the evil prince is Heat. But with DDS-2, that story is possibly flipped. Even that cruise boat dungeon? That boat was shown in those flashbacks, and Sarah mentions wanting to go on a boat as well. By the time we get to DDS-2, most of the big things are revealed. The characters know of their origins. Most of them. And the twist of the game is when everything comes into place. I've neglected to mention Roland because he does have an arc of his own in this game too. He wasn't always the leader of the Locopala, but that responsibility fell to a man named Greg. Greg also happened to be Fred's father and the leader of the Resistance. One day, a mission went awry and resulted in Greg's death. This meant that Roland now had to act as Fred's guardian and the leader of the Resistance. Feeling unfit for these responsibilities, Roland takes up to alcohol to drown his doubts and regrets in bourbon. And it isn't until meeting Surf and the others that he finally decides to take the initiative, infecting himself with a demon virus to become one of the Embryon, even marking part of his jacket yellow to symbolize that he's one of them now. It comes to a head during the midpoint, where Roland sacrifices himself to allow the others to move on with their plights, finally making up for his failures before the events of the game. This is something that all the members do at some point. Roland, Heat, Cielo, Gale, even Argilla. In fact, when Argilla's death came, I, uh... Why? 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 You can't die. It's okay, Dennis. It'll be okay. I put my best equipment on you. What? I dodged a thousand lightning bolts for your final weapon! I'm fucking serious right now? I level grinded you for hours! You are a dickweed. I took it in stride. Totally. I definitely didn't want to scream and cry. I understand that this is a lot to take in. But there's fucking more. We can now bring our attention to Gale. Unlike the rest of the Embryon, Gale is not a member of the group of scientists under Surf's weight, but is rather the reincarnation of David, Angel's lost love. Gale understands this at some point during DDS2's story, and there are subtle hints, like Gale adjusting his face with his finger, as if he were adjusting glasses despite not having any. Or the most obvious one, all the visions he sees of Angel in both games. By the time we get to the airport in part 2, Gale has embraced who he is, though he didn't reveal it to the rest of the party. Confronting Angel, the two broken souls die in each other's arms after a confrontation. A lot of people love Gale due to all of his backstory and his connection to Angel, and I can see why. Again, I'm not doing him justice by summarizing his story in a paragraph or two. By this point in the plot, the remaining members of the Embryon have been fighting and struggling to get to the facility that will allow them to upload their data, or spirits, to the Sun, to stop God from ending all of humanity. Sarah and Surf both end their lives here, and their souls begin the journey. Along the way, the final aspect of their developments truly take place. In a Dragon Ball Z-esque moment, the two fuse together, their minds slowly becoming one, and creating the new existence of the entity called Seraph. Joining Seraph are all the datas of all their friends, including Madame Cuvier, David, and even Angel. The final pieces are in place. Their journey is about to end. Through the existence of Schrodinger, Seraph and the others all work together to understand the truth behind mankind's infinite potential. 
I didn't mention Schrodinger by name until now, because it's kind of difficult to bring them into the picture until the halfway point, since they finally get a speaking role. They've been in the game since the first cutscene, but in the background. Atlas makes a point to mention them, but other than that, they're just in the background observing things. The only time they ever progress the plot in some minor way is allowing Cielo to escape captivity in the first game. And then the second game comes in, and then Schrodinger suddenly has a speaking role, revealing the twist to Surf. Even Schrodinger has more depth revealed later on after the final boss is defeated. Making their way to the final layer of the sun, Seraph and the gang all confront God in an attempt to convince him to stop his decimation of humanity. Seraph pleads with God in a vain effort, and after saying that she'll take responsibility for humanity's failings, the aspect of God, otherwise known as Brahman, challenges Seraph and the Embryon to one final fight to prove humanity's worth. Defeating Brahman, God is convinced of man's infinite potential, and honors Seraph's request. However, this leads into a situation that's rather sad. The Embryon members all begin the process of reincarnation yet again, their souls leaving to enter new bodies. However, instead, Seraph is gifted with knowledge of God, and as Angel said before, Seraph learns the meaning of life. Schrodinger reveals themselves to be another Seraph from a different universe, and the two Seraphs set off on a journey together to help other Seraphs learn the meaning of life and achieve enlightenment. Okay, that was that was a lot. Uh, is there anything I missed? Uh, oh yeah, we got to talk about the main theme and alignments of this game real quick too. Uh... It's obvious that one of the main themes of both games is exploring the idea of achieving enlightenment through understanding the meaning of life. DDS1's end goal is about reaching nirvana, which in Buddhism refers to the idea of becoming enlightened and understanding knowledge of the universe, the same thing that happened to the Buddha himself before he died. But one theme I always appreciated and recognized thanks to others is the idea of not letting the past define who you are. This is shown through just about every person in the DDS games. Surf's objectively the biggest defender of this trope, becoming arguably the best character thanks to his growth. But also the other members of the Embryon, and even the antagonists, especially Angel, embodies these themes. And then there's the alignments. You'd think that a game with a set ending wouldn't have any thought of alignments, but there are. DDS has all three alignments, Law, Chaos, and Neutral, embedded into the game in some way, shape, and form. Law is represented by Madame Cuvier, who believes that she's the one and only person who can allow people to live, specifically under the rule of her protection, just like how God is. Angel represents chaos, wishing for all of humanity to enter a life-or-death struggle every single day, devouring each other until one stands as king of the hill, much like how Lucifer and the Chaos Alignment are and hell, even the junkyard as a concept. Seraph and the rest of the Embryon all travel to God at the end of this tale to convince him that humanity can live on its own without the help of gods or demons, just like a neutral path. The fact that Atlas even bothered to include these alignments is also astonishing to me, even in a time frame like they had with the set paths and events they ultimately went with. With all of that out of the way, there's nothing left but the end. Finishing up everything, the souls of the Embryon, including Angel and the others, all walk off into the distance of a restored forest. Standing with them is Fred, as an adult, acting as their caretaker. With the final line being arguably the best note to end on for everything, in my opinion. Especially since it feels like their souls are all speaking through and reassuring Fred, and the player, that everything will be alright. Don't worry, Fred. Digital Devil Saga 1 has stronger gameplay overall, with a more focused party and more challenging combat system. 
but the story leaves many gaps in its wake, in an effort to set up Part 2. Digital Devil Saga 2 has a stronger narrative presence, with its twists retroactively making the first game completely better, along with fully embracing the themes the games propose. However, gameplay is more of the same, even with quality of life improvements. Judging each Digital Devil Saga on its own terms, I don't think either are successful as an individual product. With all the holes and gaps left by each entry, you can't exactly jump into one or the other without having issues. Individually, they're weak. But together, they make a harmonious whole. Much like forms of media like the Matrix sequels or the Kill Bill movies, Digital Devil Saga is best played with both games in mind, which is why I chose to make this video like I did, critiquing the duology together. And after doing that, mulling over everything Atlas did with this title, the DDS duology has become some of my favorite sets of games ever made. Hell, I'd say it's better than Persona and SMT combined. Yeah, I said it! I didn't think it was possible, with all the issues I suffered during the playthroughs I did. But the games were able to change my mind. I am now a huge fan of the DDS games. I want them to be remastered, but above all else, I want people to experience the Digital Devil Saga duology. Be it for gameplay, story, themes, characters, what have you. Digital Devil Saga is immaculate. And much like the characters we know and love, will live on forever. Oh my god, I'm nearing the end. Okay. So, uh, I'm just gonna freeball this section because uh, the ending of the script is in my sight. And I just want to end this so I can go back to bed and do some other stuff for a while. Thank you to everyone who stuck around to watch to the end and even bothered to click on this video at all. I appreciate you willing to let me ramble on about my undying love for the DDS games. I'd like to thank the Megaten Discord for helping me gain more information regarding the game's development, and even giving me information that not even my sources found. I can't confirm their accuracy, but their claims and information that potentially add a bigger picture to the story so I'm going to take that. Along with that, I'd like to personally thank the user JFin on Discord for discussing with me the idea of the game's themes. Other than that, uh, I don't have anything else to say. Thank you for watching, and I'll be seeing you all in the next video.